Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing our reading of Tafsir al Sadi. We are on Ayat 286 of Surah Al Baqarah. Let's begin. Bismillah rahman ar Rahim. I'll go ahead and refresh what Ayat we were on because it was a longer explanation by the Shaykh and we paused in that. So let's begin. Allah does not place on any soul a burden greater than it can bear. For it is what it has earned, and against it is what it has committed. Our Lord, do not hold us accountable if we forget or fall into error. Our Lord, do not lay on us a burden like that which you laid on those who came before us. Our Lord, do not lay on us a burden greater than we have strength to bear. Pardon us, forgive us, and have mercy on us. You are our protector. So help us against the disbelieving people. As Allah has told us about the faith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the believers who were with him, and that each person will be requited for his actions, and that man will inevitably fall short, make mistakes, and forget. He then tells us that he does not place on us any burden, greater than what we can bear. He also tells us of the supplication of the believers to that effect. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told us that Allah said, I have done that in response to this supplication. Our Lord, do not hold us accountable if we forget or fall into error. The difference between the two is that forgetting occurs when one becomes absent-minded about what he is instructed to do. So he fails to do it because he forgot it. Errors occur when a person aims to do something that is permissible. Then the result of his action is not permissible. Allah has pardoned this Ummah for whatever they fall into of these two things, out of mercy and kindness towards them. Based on that, if a person prays wearing a stolen or unclean garment, or he forgot about some impurity that was on his body, or he talks during the prayer because he forgot, or he does something that breaks the fast because he forgot, or he does one of the actions that are forbidden when in ihram but does not involve killing an animal. This refers to hunting, which is forbidden when in ihram, and for which a compensatory sacrifice must be offered because he forgot. He is forgiven for that by the same token. The one who swore an oath not to do something is not regarded as having broken his oath if he does the thing he swore not to do because he forgot. Similarly, if a person kills someone accidentally or destroys property accidentally, there is no sin on him. Okay, so we see this thing about accidents. Well, now, what I think is interesting is there's like a drunk driver they may not intended to run somebody over but they could hit somebody and, and kill them I remember there was a woman who was drunk she was a politician she was speeding along super super fast she had six DUIs already and she crashed into a car with a pregnant woman and her children and her husband and all of them died and they were on their way to go to get their ultrasound done, they found out. So, that to me is like, whoa, you, you're a piece of trash. You know every time you get behind the wheel that you're drunk, that you're getting ready, you're prepared to take someone's life. Rather, he is liable and must offer some compensation because of the results of his actions, not because of his sin. Okay, so, compensation, I, so prison time, I hope. Similarly, if a person forgets to mention the name of Allah, at times when he should mention his name, it does not matter. Okay, so there's some mercy, obviously. Our Lord, do not lay on us a burden that is difficult, responsibilities like that which you laid on those who came before us. And Allah, the mighty and sublime, answered this supplication as he granted concessions to the Summa in manners pertaining to purification, 
and different acts of worship, which he made easier in a way that he did not for other nations. Our Lord did not lay on us a burden greater than we have strength to bear. Allah has answered this supplication also. To him be praise. Pardon us, forgive us, and have mercy on us. Pardon and forgiveness are acts by means of which one may ward off evil and harm. Mercy is that by virtue of which one attains well-being in one's affairs. So mercy is that by virtue of which one attains well-being in all affairs. You are our protector, that is, you are our Lord, sovereign and God, whose protection and care for us have never faltered since you created us and formed us. Your blessing is constantly bestowed upon us at every moment of our lives. Moreover, you have bestowed upon us a great blessing and marvelous gift, naming the blessing of Islam, to which all other blessings are secondary. So we ask you, O our Lord and Sovereign, to complete your blessings by helping us against the disbelieving people who have disbelieved in you and your messenger, peace be upon him, opposed the followers of your religion and disobeyed you. Help us against them with proof and evidence. So help us with proof and evidence, the disbelieving people. I end on the battlefield by causing us to prevail in the land and causing their defeat. Bless us with faith and righteous deeds that lead to victory. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. I also like when it says Lord of the worlds because it reminds me that we're not the only world. That is very deep when you think about it. So hopefully no one's praying in anything stolen. Because if you're a thief, you're trash. But if it's unclean, you know, that, that's always terrible if you're praying and you're like, oh. So try to work on that. Hopefully, inshallah, people can have um, a fresh garment for each day of the week plus extra. So that they can change it every day. But, again, things get dirty when you're cleaning and whatnot. I think they're putting seeds in their water bowl. Okay, this is the end of the commentary of Surah Al-Baqarah. All praise and thanks are for Allah. And may the blessings and peace of Allah be upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his family and his companions abundantly until the day of judgment. MashaAllah, I mean that's been a long journey reading tafsir of the of that of, of Surah Al Baqarah. So now we're in Surah Ali Imran. Okay. The first eighty odd verses of this surah have to do with debating with the Christians, highlighting the flaws in their arguments and calling them to enter the true religion, which is Islam. As the first part of Surah Al-Baqarah spoke of debating with the Jews, as discussed previously, in the name of Allah, the Most Gracious, Most Merciful. 3.1 Alif Lam Mim Allah, there is no God but He, the ever-living, the sustaining... Sorry. Allah, there is no God but He, the ever-living, the self-sustaining, and all-sustaining. He has sent down to you the book in truth, confirming what came before it, and He sent down the Torah and the Gospel. Before this, as a guide to humankind, and He sent down the criterion between right and wrong, then those who disbelieve in the revelations of Allah will suffer a severe punishment. And Allah is Almighty, an avenger. From Allah, verily, nothing is hidden on earth or in the heavens. He it is who shapes you in the wombs as He wills. There is no God but He, the Almighty, the Most Wise. So the shaping in the wombs is a, something that doesn't get appreciated by abortion-loving feminists because they just call it a clump of selves because they're trashy people. They're a death cult. But... When you look at the ultrasounds and you just watch your little tot grow and they have some interesting ultrasounds that are 3D-ish that can actually get like a full scan of your baby. 
However, it's not that healthy to do uh, due to the radiation and whatnot. And there's other research that shows that that's just not good for your kid. But you see that the, how they change and how they move and you're like, whoa. The, each week that goes by, your little tot is changing and growing. And so that that's a special one, especially for moms. Especially with the technology we have now that we just see how they take shape. There's this little peanut, this little bean, and then before you know it, they get their own button nose and their little tatty toes, their little face, you know, their eye color, but then they're going to have curly hair. It's really adorable. Allah, the mighty and sublime, begins with this surah by telling us of his divinity and that he is God and there is no God but he. No devotion nor worship should be directed to anyone but him. So remember, no, no devotion or worship should be directed to one other than Allah. So devotion, let's write that to the side. When you say, I'm devoted to you, you know, uh, you're, you're locked in, you're devoted to someone to the point of worship, you're doing shirk, basically. Everything other than him that is worshipped is false. So there's some people who ha hate it when you say, we have the one true religion. See, what I hate is when, when Muslims will sometimes play the liberal milk toast fence sitting. And they're like, oh, your religion is this valid and your religion is that. Like, you can see that they're trying to play the woke inclusivity, all religions are equal card. And I'm not buying that. Not buying that at all. And here you see that, no. Everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is worshipped is false. So stop placating. Allah is the true God who has the divine attributes that are inherently implied in these two names. The ever-living is the one who has life in which the life in the most perfect sense, which implies all attributes without which life cannot be complete or perfect, such as hearing, seeing, power, strength, greatness, eternal life, and unsurpassable might. Unsurpassable might. So when you have an idiot who says, oh, uh, everything has an equal and opposite reaction. So the devil and God, they're equal and opposites. No, no. Andrew Tate said that. We don't believe that. Everything happens as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits. Nothing can surpass the might of Allah. The self-sustaining and all-sustaining is the one who sustains himself and has no need of any of his creation. Perfect, let's underline that. And the one who sustains all others. Yes, he sustains us. We are in need of him. All created beings need him to be brought into existence. This is another key aspect. Atheists cannot create a machine to bring in a human soul. They can't do that. No matter how they try to take a cervix and put it into a guy and call it a trans, no matter the the mad, borderline, unethical, cruel science they do on animals and whatnot, they can't do that. And I don't believe they're cloning. Like, oh, we got these clones, so we, we got like five Joe Bidens because he's cloned. It's like, I don't, what are you talking about? No, we are unique. To be formed and shaped and to be sustained. He is the one who controls the affairs of all creatures, body, mind, and soul. One aspect of his sustaining and caring for his slaves and showing mercy towards them is that he sent down to his messenger Muhammad وسلم, the book, which is the greatest and holiest of the books, containing truth in its stories, commands, and prohibitions. What he says is truth and what he orders is justice. He sent it down in truth so that people would worship their Lord and learn his book. 
confirming what came before it of the previous books. So it is a judge over them. Okay, so it is a judge. What it confirms is to be accepted and what it refutes is to be rejected. What you find in the Quran or rulings that our previous messengers agreed upon, you will find in other books too. And these previous books testify that the Quran is truly from Allah. But the people of the book cannot truly believe in their books if they do not believe in the Quran. Their disbelief in it undermines their belief in their own books. Okay, so that's an interesting angle. He contends that if they do not believe in the Quran, then their disbelief undermines their own faith in their books. So what we what we agree upon, we accept, and what differentiates, we reject. So ours is the final criterion. Then Allah Asawajo says, and he sent down the Torah to Musa and the gospel. To Isa Jesus before this, that is, before the sending down of the Quran as a guide to humankind. The apparent meaning of this phrase is that it refers to everything mentioned previously. That is, Allah sent down the Quran, the Torah, and the Gospel as a guide to humankind to steer them away from misguidance. So whoever accepts the guidance of Allah is guided, and whoever does not accept it will remain misguided. So, the guidance of Allah is the only way you can be guided. Without it, you're going to remain misguided. And he sent down the criterion between right and wrong. That is, definitive arguments, proof, and evidence that point to the right path. Thus Allah explains what people need to know so that the rulings will remain clear. And no one will have any excuse or argument for not believing in Allah and his revelation. Hence he says, then those who disbelieve in revelations of Allah, that is, after he has explained them and made them clear and removed any ambiguity, will suffer a punishment that no one can imagine how severe it is or comprehend its nature. So the punishment here is mentioned. And then not being able to comprehend its nature, you can see how utterly painful that's going to be. And Allah is almighty, that is powerful, and nothing is beyond him, an avenger against those who disobey him. So an avenger against those who disobey him, nothing is beyond the capacity of Allah. From Allah, verily nothing is hidden on earth or in the heavens. This is an affirmation that his knowledge encompasses all things manifest and hidden, visible and invisible, including the fetus in the womb that cannot be seen by other created beings, and of which they have no knowledge at the time when he is caring for it in the best manner, and it's developing according to his decree. It's developing according to his decree. Hence he says, he it is who shapes you in the wombs as he wills, complete or incomplete, Beautiful or ugly, male or female, the Almighty, the Most Wise. So, if you see the... Let's talk about this for a second. There are a lot of cultures and people who get mad when they have a girl. Some men, when they sire girls, they like, Oh, you couldn't do a boy? And the, you think about how King Henry VIII, the Christian, wanted a boy so bad, but he kept murking his wives, finding any trying to reason, trying to divorce. He just wasn't happy with a girl. You can see the ingratitude. And so people were constantly trying to figure out, is it the man or the woman who decides the gender? What decides the gender? And today scientists are trying to figure out how they can engineer babies what colors can they have what can we do to design them design our babies can we pick the genders and then IVF in vitro something something fertilization they'll have like embryos of boys and girls and 
They like they like destroy the other ones. It's a really brutal practice, and they pick them on their gender, but it's a very nasty thing. I remember a gay couple used a surrogate, and they thought they were gonna get a boy, but they got a girl, and then they tried to sue and didn't want to take the baby. And so you see the nastiness of that. But if you look at here and you see that it's a law upon which Allah who dec decrees if it's a male or female, then you should be grateful, right? This verse affirms the divinity of Allah and that it is His alone and they declare false divinity of anything other than Him. This is a refutation of the Christians who claim that Isa ibn Maryam, may I be at peace with him, was divine. This verse also affirms the perfect life of Allah who is self-sustaining and sustains others completely. These two attributes, divinity and perfect life, imply all the other divine attributes, as discussed above. These verses also affirm the great scriptures and tell us that they were a mercy and guidance for people. Hence people are divided into those who are guided and those who are not. And those who do not follow the guidance of these scriptures will be punished. There is also affirmation of the vastness of Allah's knowledge and that his will and wisdom always come to pass. So Allah's will and wisdom always come to pass. Now we're in 3.7. It is he who has sent down to you the book, in it are definitive verses, which are the foundation of the book. Others are ambiguous, but those in the whose hearts is a deviation, follow the part thereof that is ambiguous, seeking to cause confusion and seeking an interpretation that suits them, but no one knows a true interpretation except the law. And those who are firmly grounded in knowledge say, We believe in the book, all of it is from our Lord. None will pay heed except people of understanding. Our Lord, do not let our hearts deviate now, after you have guided us and bestow upon us mercy from yourself, for you are the bestower. Our Lord, you will gather all people on the day of which there is no doubt, for Allah does not break his promise. So here I, I notice this part. We believe in the book. All of it is from our Lord. You'll see Christians apologizing constantly for the Old Testament. They're horrified by it. I did a video a while ago of Michaela Peterson. Like She was saying how scared she was of Islam, and I was like, have you read the Old Testament? And Christians will say, well, yeah, you know, Jesus came, he changed all that. And it's like, yeah, but that's still your God. That's still your God who commanded that and let that happen and wanted that to happen. What are you talking about? But they're deeply ashamed. They want to be revisionists. They want to be liberals so bad. They're like a, a lion that rips out their own claws. An eagle that plucks out their own flying feathers. We're different than them. We believe in everything. We don't bend over backwards to say, Oh no, that's in the past. Don't look at anything of it. Don't fall around of it. Oh no, we have to abandon everything in that part of the book. I've literally had Christians hand me just the New Testament. It's usually in a red or blue small little book. And... They're like, here's the New Testament. They can literally cut out half of their Bible and just focus on the New Testament. That's wild. The entire Quran is definitive. As Allah, the mighty and sublime, says, This is a book, the verse of which the verses of which are perfected, then explained in detail from one who is most wise, all aware. Hud eleven one. It is precise, based on clarity, justice, and perfection. But who could be better in judgment than Allah for a people who are certain in faith? al maida 550 All of it is similar in beauty and eloquence, with some parts confirming others, and with similarities in terms of wording and meaning. With regard to the definitive clarity and ambiguity mentioned in the verse, Allah says, in reference to the Quran, in it are definitive verses, that is, 
their meaning is clear and there is no ambiguity or confusion. Which are the foundation of the book, that is, they form the basic reference point in light of which any ambiguous verse is to be understood and they form the greater part of the book. Okay, so when you have something ambiguous, then you need to look at what the less ambiguous ones for a reference point, see if you can figure it out. Others are ambiguous, that is, the meaning not clear to many people because the wording is very general. Or they may be misunderstood by some. To sum up, some of the verses are clear to everyone and there are the majority that form the reference point for others. And there are other verses which may be unclear to some people. In that case, they must. what they must do is refer that which is ambiguous to that which is definitive. Okay, yes, so it was on the right track. And that which is unclear to that which is clear. In that way, one will find that some parts of the book confirm others. And there will be no contradiction or conflict in meaning. But people are divided into two groups. So people are divided into two groups. But those in whose hearts is deviation, that is, an inclination away from righteousness because of corrupt motives. Their aim is to follow misguidance. Their hearts have deviated from the path of guidance. All the, the part thereof, that is, ambiguous, that is, they forsake what is definitive and clear, and go to that which is ambiguous. Thus they approach the matter backwards, trying to interpret that which is definitive in the light of what they want to understand from the ambiguous verses, which results in confusion. Okay, so I've heard people levy this at other Dawa people, and I found it to be an interesting uh, critique, so I guess we have to watch out for that ourselves, right? Seeking to cause confusion to those whom they call to follow them because that which is ambiguous may be interpreted in such a way as to cause confusion due to its ambiguous nature. However, that which is clear and definitive cannot be a cause of confusion because the true meaning is clear to anyone who seeks to follow the truth and seeking an interpretation that suits them. But no one knows its true interpretation except the law. So when you when I read that, it's a little hopeful because you're like, you, you read it and you're like, oh God, what's, what's the meaning? And I think that you will get, we'll have some mercy on us because if we get it wrong, our intentions were good and, and I think that Allah will help us, I think. I like to, and I think it's beneficial to read many interpretations so that you can say like, hmm, what do they say? What does my brain think? Okay, weigh it. And then have that hope in your heart uh, that you'll be on the right path, but know that Allah has the ultimate interpretation. There are two opinions among the commentators as to whether the sentence ends with the word Allah. The majority are of the view that it does end there. Others are of the view that it continues. So what it means is, but no one knows its true interpretation except the law and those who are firmly grounded in knowledge. Both meanings are possible. If interpretation is aimed at finding out the truth about the matter and its real nature, then the correct opinion is to stop at the phrase except the law, because Allah has kept knowledge of the true meaning of the ambiguous verses to himself, as in the case of the exact nature of the attributes of Allah and how they are, and the exact nature of the events that will occur on the last day and so on. These are matters the true nature of which is known only to Allah. It is not permissible to try to understand the nature of these things, because that is something that cannot be known. Imam Malik, may Allah have mercy on him, was asked about the verse, the most gracious rose over the throne in a manner that befits his majesty, Taha 25. The questioner said, how did he rise over? Imam Malik said, the rising over is known in linguistic terms. How, with regard to Allah, is unknown. Belief in it is obligatory, and asking about its nature is an innovation. Be that. I've heard this 
I've heard this phrase, but I forgot that it was by Imam Malik who said it, because I've heard the Sheikhs on Scully Subtitles channel talk about it. Um, the phrase, in a manner that befits his majesty, is another, uh, I've, another one that I've heard. And I find that to be very beneficial, because there's so many different things that we don't really uh, comprehend. Someone did an experiment for an ex for example. Okay, so if you look at the skeleton of a rabbit and how you would think it would look, it doesn't really look like that. But when you look at a rabbit, you're like, oh, it's so fluffy and cute. But when somebody tries to like add the layers of flesh onto the rabbit, it looks way more ugly. And so when you look at the skeletals, like remains of an animal you, you don't you don't know what it would look like with the flesh and the fur and all that on it you know, that's so strippy so extending that you realize hmm okay we have to say in a way that befits Allah's majesty because we can't really imagine something that outside of our consciousness like if you can look at the skeleton of a fish and not know what the scale colors are, not even know what kind of eye color it had, well, how can you think you can know God then? If you look inside a PlayStation 4, all these cables, you wouldn't really be able to realize what it's going to do when you put the game in and how it's like working in like these video games. So think about You put the disc in for the game. You're doing all this stuff in the game. Just looking at the disc, you couldn't even imagine. You know? So, it is funny that we always think our brains will compute exactly how something happened when in the real world, we can't really do that. We can't. Even when they create prescription meds, they think, okay, we got, we got we put this here. So, okay, what's going to happen now? And then they do test results, all of that, the side effects. So even then, you have to have some humility. But again, a lot of secular liberal atheists worship their own mind and desires. And then they mock us for not knowing exactly how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does something. But if you looked at a rabbit skeleton and I told you to tell me all the niche things that that creature would do, you wouldn't be able to tell me. Just from the skeleton, right? And we have the bare bones information in the Quran, right? So we can't invent stuff and twist it. Think about it. We get to have an outline. A skeleton is like an outline. We don't get to have the exact blueprint. And so that's when we have to have some faith. We have to have some reasoning. Something similar may be said concerning all the divine attributes. To one who asks how they are, he should be told something similar to what Imam Malik said, that the attribute is known, but how it is not known. So the attribute is known, but how it's not known. So the attribute itself, but not how. Believing in it is obligatory and asking about its nature is an innovation. Because if you think about that, the person you're asking don't know. How would they know? So when an atheist has a super high standard of like, show me God is real. And you're like, are you okay? Can you, sh like if you only had a skeleton of, let's say, an iguana. And there was no more left. Even trying to explain, like, okay, we have these ideas about everything this iguana did, you know? Even from down to the peculiarities, you'd be like, mm, you're kind of inventing a lot of stuff up. Which is what they do a lot with dinosaurs. If dinosaurs are even real, you know? It's, it's really fascinating. They would have to make it up. 
They'd have to be like, oh, no, I, 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 I think it this way it happened that way. No. Allah has told us of it, but he has not told us how it is. So we must be content with the limit that he has set for us. Aha, key here. Content with the limit. Content with the limit that has been set. But those who have devious inclinations seek out these ambiguous and unclear matters and seek to discuss that which does not concern them. They put effort into trying to understand that which we cannot comprehend because no one knows it except the law. For example, let me give you good. So ours is very wise. Our religion is very wise. We say as if it's the law's majesty. We have a limit of what we can know. When you see people talk about the Anunnaki past civilizations, they fill in a lot of it with music and AI. And they got some ancient scripts, some ancient tablets. And they think they know exactly like how everything happened and you see them fill in a lot and you're like hmm now now you're going too far here buddy we don't we don't do that in Islam see in other creeds they can innovate it would happen like this happen like that bam 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 for us what's here is here and that's where it stays those who are firmly grounded in knowledge believe in it, but they leave the meaning to Allah. They leave it to Him and thus are safe. However, if what is meant by interpretation is explanation and clarification, then the correct view is to connect those who are firmly grounded in knowledge to Allah. Thus we may understand that interpreting that which is ambiguous in light of that which is definitive and removing the ambiguity is a process that no one knows except Allah and those who are well grounded in knowledge. Hence they believe in it and refer to it the definitive text and say all of it. Both the definitive and ambiguous text is from our Lord and there can be no contradiction in that which is from Him. Rather it is harmonious and some parts of it confirm and support one another. This points to an important major principle which is that if they know that all of it is from Allah and they are not sure about the exact meaning of an ambiguous verse, they know for certain that it is to be referred to the definitive verses, even if they do not know how to go about doing that. Mm. Referring to the definitive. As Allah encourages people to submit to him and believe in his rulings and he has warned against the following that which is ambiguous he says so when I, you think about the you'll see women will do this with a job oh the Quran does you know it's there may be some ambiguity there but they'll say we don't have to wear it it's not compulsory and no you can't be forced to wear it so you know just the hijab isn't part of Islam and then you're like, you're twisting it and you're taking something that seems, can, it can be a little ambiguous, but if you're trying to pretend that you can wear apple bottom jeans and tube tops and a, and a hat and that that's the same as a hijab and being fully covered, I mean, you're just, you're just pulling my leg here. But they use that ambiguity in order to twist just like what that lady did on LinkedIn yesterday. She said, oh, there's no compulsion in religion, so you can't uh, compel a woman to wear a hijab. And it's like, are you crazy? Men are the leaders. If a father or a husband and sisters are saying to this woman, you need to cover up, you know, stop wearing tube tops. Stop, you know, wearing yoga pants. You're telling her we can't put some pressure on her and be like you can't what's up going on with you so your job can make you have a dress code like you work in a bank you gotta wear a suit you can't just show up with sweatpants and a wife beater and flip-flops 
and expect to work. So your job can force you, but the creator and sustainer of us all can't compel you to cover and the best in your community can't compel you to cover up. Are you crazy? None will pay heed, that is, no one will understand the admonition of Allah and accept his advice and teachings except people of understanding, that is, people of sound reasoning, who are the best of the people and elite among the sons of Adams. Okay, so, so admonitions, understanding the admonitions of Allah and accepting the teachings and their there are people who have sound reasoning. Okay, so sound reasoning. Intoxicants impair one's reasoning. Because why does a liberal atheist push so many intoxicants? They, they call you animals to your faces. They tell you, look at how the bonobos are humping and itching their balls. You need to be just like that. Look how they wife swap. You know, look at that. That's how you need to be. Now, I look at nature and I think a lot of amazing things. Okay, especially ants. Bugs are scary, right? But when an atheist says we're all animals, they're telling you to be bestial, carnal, vicious. Because if you see how the animal kingdom is, there's no room for emotion. It is what it is. And it's brutal. I mean, I've seen, I like, like watching it, but the way animals talk. There was like a, a, a white bird, it looked like an egret. It had tall legs, there's so many birds. It took one of its babies and just like dropped it out of the nest. And I think it's like the weakest one they select to just drop off a cliff. And you're like, say what? But us humans, we try to help the babies in the NICUs of the hospitals, but there's also women who, uh, for example, I took a screenshot, I haven't posted it yet, but there was a man who had a newborn baby with the umbilical cord just recently cut and he left it naked on the ground and then ran off. And firefighters found a baby. So you're like, what the hell is wrong with people? So when a human acts like an animal, you see extreme cruelty. Okay, ducks, okay. oh, they they are very uh, aggressive with the females. If you see how aggressive animals are in their mating, and then a, a feminist will be like, she'll be an atheist. Say we're all animals. It's like okay, then you're justifying our wording. You can't, I don't like calling us animals. We're not animals. We're, we are a different creation. Oh, well, we're mammals. We breastfeed, therefore we're animals. And it's like, are you okay? All right, so if we want to have sound reasoning and be the best and elite among the sons of Adam, the, the people of Adam, the progeny of Adam, then we have to make sure we protect our ability to understand. Because... To comprehend something, you need to have a sound mind. Okay? So, sound mind. That's related to sound reasoning. If you use drugs, you can't make good decisions. It takes that away. That's why men love to give women alcohol so that they can get tipsy, so they can get a piece of booty. You know, and it's it's not hard to get over her her wall. It's a social lubricant, okay, and it helps them make those women black out as well, so that they can run a train on her, or do some some crime against her. She won't even be able to remember the faces because she was so hammered, okay. And then when you look at what the crimes women do to themselves. They're desperate for drugs. They're not thinking rationally. They're like, I have withdrawal symptoms. I need to go get this drug, get anything. Like, they do terrible things. It's horrible. Absolutely horrible. And so, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to be free from intoxicants and then tells us to understand the admonitions and to apply them. That's 
towards the straight path. All right, that's a beautiful thing. The admonition reaches their minds, so they pay attention to what will benefit them, and they do it. And they take note of what will harm them, and they avoid it. See, they take note of what will harm them. A toxicants only harm you. And that's why if you see a Christian conservative who's pushing um, alcohol, you're like, man, you guys are scumbags. Total scumbags. You just drank wine. And it's like, yeah, how many Christians have died of alcohol? quite a lot how many christian marriages have been broken up because of alcoholism or how many christians committed adultery because of alcohol but yet they bend over backwards to justify it a catholic italian chugs red wine and it's astounding an american christian loves them some whiskey loves them some beer it's pathetic but they're not of sound mind their reasoning is impaired it's, it's disgusting. And you're more suggestible. You're able to be infiltrated and misguided and brainwashed. But in the case of others, they are like dross in which there is no benefit. And which produces nothing. No rebuke or reminder will benefit them because they are devoid of reason. Devoid of reason. Then Allah, the mighty and sublime, tells us about those who are firmly grounded in knowledge. They call upon him and say, Our Lord, do not let our hearts deviate now after you have guided us. That is, do not cause our hearts to incline away from the truth out of ignorance or stubbornness on our part. Rather, cause us to follow the straight path, to be guided and to guide others. Make us steadfast in adhering to your guidance and keep us safe from that which those who deviate suffer. So, Make us steadfast in adhering to your guidance. So, the Sharia. Guidance. And then, following the rules. Now, when you're steadfast in adhering to the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the liberal atheist calls you an extremist. Because they want you to break your faith. They want you to be a hedonistic, drugged out in debt drones that's why they say legalize tax and regulate all drugs a uh, sex workers real work you can just see their their nastiness and bestow upon us mercy from yourself that is grant mercy by means of which you guide us to that which will help us to do good and will protect us from evil. For you are the bestower, that is, you give in abundance and are very kind. Your generosity reaches all created beings. Our Lord, you will gather all the people on the day on which there is no doubt, for Allah does not break his promise. He will requite them for their deeds, both good and bad. So. Allah has promised us that we will, will be requited for our good and bad deeds. So we have to have firmness in that. So you do good deeds by your husband. He doesn't appreciate it. Know you're going to be rewarded for it. So don't become nihilistic and cynical. It's, it's going to be all right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises those who are firmly grounded in knowledge for having seen, oh sorry, for having seven attributes, which are the key to happiness they are one knowledge which is the way to reach Allah for it explains his ruling and law and laws so seeking knowledge two deep knowledge which does not refer to merely having some knowledge rather the one who has deep knowledge is the scholarly person who has certain knowledge and practices precise scholarship so deep knowledge Allah has taught him the apparent and hidden meanings with regard to rulings and so on. He is deeply immersed in the wisdom of Sharia in terms of knowing, shaping his character, and acting upon it. 3. Allah describes such people as believers in his book in its entirety. For they refer that which is ambiguous to that which is definitive. We believe in the book. All of it is from our Lord. 4. 
They ask Allah for well-being and protection from that which those who deviate suffer. Five, they acknowledge the blessing of Allah for having bestowed guidance upon them. As they say, our Lord, do not let our hearts deviate now after you have guided us. Six, nevertheless, they ask him for his mercy, which leads to all that is good and wards off all that is evil. They seek his mercy by virtue of his name, the store Al-Wahhab. Oh, the bestower Al-Wahhab. Wait a minute, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab? So... The bestower. So if you have a last name or a name means Wahhab means bestower. Oh, yeah, cool. Allah tells us of their faith and certainty in the day of resurrection and their fear of Him. This is what should motivate them to strive to protect themselves from falling into error. Then Allah, the mighty and sublime, says, As for those who believe neither their wealth nor their children will avail them at all against the law, it is they who will be fuel for the fire, as was the case with the people of Pharaoh and those who came before them. They rejected our signs, and Allah seized them because of their sins, for Allah is severe in punishment. Say to the disbelievers, you will be defeated and driven together to hell. What a wretched resting place. There has already been for you a sign in the two groups that met in combat. One was fighting in the cause of Allah, the other disbelieving in Allah. They saw them with their own eyes, twice their number. But Allah supports with his help whomever he wills. And this is a lesson for those who have insight. Okay, so even if you're outnumbered, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can help you prevail. In history, we've seen some remarkable examples of warfare. And the disbelievers, they will be defeated and driven together to hell. That hell is a wretched place. I've heard uh, a guy once say, he was mocking churching Christians and Bible thumpers. So basically people who actually practice Christianity correctly. He was saying, if heaven is filled with people like you, then I'd rather be in hell. And I thought to myself, what? You should never wish yourself to be in hell. You have to be very careful with what you say. Because we see here, it's a wretched place. Here, Allah tells us that those who disbelieve in him and his messengers and reject his religion and his book are deserving of punishment and indeed the most severe punishment for their disbelief and their sins their wealth and their children will not avail them at all even though in this world they may be useful in warding off some of these calamities that may befall them so notice here so if you do not believe in Islam you are deserving of punishment and you're going to get a severe punishment for your disbelief and your sins. So you cannot buy your way out of hell. And your children cannot get you out of hell. This is a very scary thing. Because if you have pious children and then you're bad and then you go to hell, your children can't supplicate and save you. They say, we are more abundant in wealth than children and we are not going to be punished. Sabah 34, 35. But on the day of resurrection, there will appear to them from Allah that which they had not reckoned on. The evil consequences of what they have earned will become apparent to them, and the very thing, punishment they used to ridicule, will overwhelm them. Azumar 3940. So what they used to ridicule will overwhelm them. Children and wealth will have no value before Allah. Rather, what will benefit a person will be his faith in Allah and his righteous deeds. So, a lot of people with money think that because this realm values the wealthy, that it will somehow have some ability in the afterlife. 
What's fascinating is that Allah shows you because you got all this stuff, right? And just imagine you had a fistful of jewels, you know, like you're talking to a guy and you're like, and he's like, okay, I'll do the deal. That has like a tangible persuasion, right? Think about how these, these, these gold diggers, these women who sell access to their body for a purse and they're like, come here. You want a purse? Chuck it at her. It's a 2K purse, right? It's $2,000. Now I'll let my homeboys do all this stuff to you and pee on you. And it's just like, okay, I'm, 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 I'm wanted. I'm this, I'm special. And you're like, this is this chick letting degrade herself for a purse. So the materialism, it does something to people here. It has this effect. Materialism really does. And yet when you go to the grave, you're like, you're going in the dirt. It's like you can't, you physically can't take those items to the next abode. You know, you can't. Even if they put all your treasure in your grave and they buried it, it would do nothing except make people want to loot you, like what we do to the Egyptians. That's another thing. The Egyptians had all this wealth. They bury it in their little tombs and whatever, their sarcophaguses. And now today people loot them. There was a time when people just went around grave robbing. You know, you can't take those physical items to the spiritual realm, right? But an action you did is like a transmission of energy. If you give someone a compliment, you fed someone, this action will exist and it's recorded, right? You could have a bank vault filled with money and it doesn't really mean anything even today my, what is money I like well, people keep talking about digital currencies and then you realize banksters can literally just type in money in their account out of nowhere think about that who decides how much money is worth think of all the different currencies how it fluctuates inflation deflation taxes like money it, it's such a weird thing such a weird thing and that in this realm it it has this ability to hold you down right health insurance bills now a law can grant you a position where you get more fake money and you survive right there's lots of different measures of wealth health is wealth, family is wealth, and what's fascinating is that nothing in your apartment your home is coming with you your body's there it's still surrounded by all the materials that you bought and used to bribe people with. All the things that you piled up to feel special, to feel validated. You thought you were better than someone because you had, you know, a $7 million necklace. You had a $20,000 watch. You had $300 pair of shoes. You had a hat that was 200 Your nails cost this much. They're still sticking behind. But your deeds... And your faith in Allah, that's what's coming with you. Like your soul, it's going to be coming out. And everything else is staying. And also how you treated people, it's like in their brain. And all these people you interact with, they all have a different version of you in their head. That's another weird thing. All the different ways people see you. <laughs> You're a villain right now in someone else's life. You're a good friend in someone else's. You're a mystery in other people's. It's quite remarkable. And Allah is going to judge you in a, the most accurate sense outside of your own perception. That's what's trippy too. Mm. Subhanallah. Very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Let me know what you think. We'll pause here. We've done quite a lot today in Tafsir as Sadi. It's been a wonderful long journey. And I have enjoyed being able to have extra time this summer break to get some heavy reading in on camera for the channel. I hope you all benefit from this. I hope you like learning with me. We give it as a study with me session. If you'd like to support my work, you can do so by going to www.subscribestar.com 
slash Mahone Archive. And please like, comment, and share.